uh, whether you're a mother or not, if you're a lady, 18 years and up, there's a gift for you. Uh, see Sister D. Sheldon about that if you have any questions. Amen. Let's all stand and pray. Open the service with prayer. Lord, we thank you, Jesus, for this blessed day, and we pray your blessing upon it. Bless and anoint each and every person, Lord, who has come into your house. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We're so blessed. Stand in your presence. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm chapter 30, verse 11 says, Thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing. Thou hast put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. We are here to worship. We are here to rejoice and celebrate the King of Kings today.
just experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your
cake to take that I cake control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. And my faith will be made stronger. Trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Church family, at this time I would ask all of us to uh, stretch our hands toward Pastor Sister Walker. They'll be coming up here toward the front. And uh, as most of you know, in a, in a, in a short while, service. They'll be heading to uh, the airport to board uh, a jet going to Scotland. So it's going to be a long night and they're going to have three weeks of uh, ministry in, in, uh, in uh, the UK and in Europe. And let's pray a covering over them that the angels of the Lord camp about them. Let's have faith. Remember every day a sign-up sheet for daily prayer and fasting. Let's just focus toward them, stretch hands toward them. In Jesus' name, Lord, we pray for our pastor and pastor's wife, Lord. They will be living shortly to go to the airport, Lord, and go, Jesus, to several airports, Lord. God, they'll be traveling many, many miles, Lord, cars, buses. hearts of the hearers, God. Shine light upon those, Jesus, who are sitting in darkness. Lord, and give Pastor and Sister Walker favor with them. Spirit of revelation, spirit of revelation and knowledge to fall on those who are going to minister to God. Keep them safe in the travels. Touch their health, Lord. Touch their strength. Spirit, soul, and body in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Praise God. Well, it's a wonderful day. God bless all the mothers and a happy Mother's Day to you. Amen. Let's give the mothers a hand. Amen. Praise God. Years ago, there was this young man, he meant well, but he said, I thank the Lord for my mother. If it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be here today. And so we can all say that. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I want to welcome all the mothers, and I want you to know, if you haven't already been told, that we were busy getting luggage loaded in because we have to go straight to the airport, and I had to have the Brandon come and get us because when I hit Plymouth last night on my way home from the campground, my uh, trusted vehicle decided it was not very trustworthy and uh, it started losing power and started shaking and and when I would try to give it gas it would just uh, misfire so being a very poor auto mechanic and I had no idea what was going on but I did know how to pray I said now Lord we have got to leave tomorrow I have got to get home to pack. 
I have never prayed for an automobile any harder than I prayed for that automobile last night. And I literally was in prayer that whole rest of the time. It couldn't gain much uh, uh, more than just a, a slow MPH. I felt sorry for the people behind me. But uh, God, when I pulled in that driveway and into that garage, I've never been more thankful to the Lord for getting a car to the place I was trying to get it to. And uh, so I really, sincerely, I, I, from the depths of my spirit, I think we can pray in situations like that. And I think God kept that vehicle and got it into the garage so I could focus on the more important things of getting ready for this missions trip. Uh, but I just want to say thank you to the Michigan District Bible Quiz Coordinators who are right here from our church, and that is Brother Josh and Sister Carly Knapp. They had much help from Justin and Tiffany Maine. They had help from Lauren Brandon. They had everybody who helped yesterday at the campground. Just stand up right now. We want to acknowledge. Uh, David, you were there helping me judge, and uh, Eric was there helping me judge, and Tim and Davion, all of you that were there, let's give them a hand. They were such a blessing, such a blessing at the campground yesterday, and so many, so many uh, quizzers were ministered to, and one of the quizzers that used to quiz under my purview, and I was the North American quiz master, was coaching the team from Salem, Illinois, which went undefeated at the tournament. And, you know, that that's that's what we commonly call God's country, right? But uh, uh, all of the earth is God's country. Amen? Let's clap our hands to this God who's in control of it all. Praise God. And then I want to say, I'm, I know it's already been said, but I'd like all of our mothers just to stand up. We always have a gift for our mothers every Mother's Day, and we want you to stand right now, and we want to honor you, and then we're going to be honoring a very special mother in just a moment, and a very special father, and a very special baby, and that baby's very special sisters and relatives, and we are just so thankful. Let's give all our mothers a big round of applause. We will uh, be trying to, I, I was able to sign up with uh, Verizon to uh, be able to receive calls uh, and, and connect with uh, Brother Herring when need be. He will be the point person that will uh, let me know if there is something that needs my attention during this time so you can contact him you can talk, contact many wonderful people in this church if you're needing counsel if you're needing strength if you're needing prayer aren't you thankful we have such a church family that is seasoned and 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 it's there are just so many people and uh there are i counted up we now have eight licensed ministers and soon it will be nine as a part of Faith Apostolic Church of Troy. So you're going to be in great hands. And uh, our thought will be trying to transmit some pictures. Uh, I got that thing from Verizon, Verizon so we can transmit pictures and let you know and see uh, the progress of what you're praying for on the mission field. Is that okay? Praise God. Well, this is a very special Mother's Day event because we have the awesome privilege of dedicating a precious, precious baby girl to the Lord. It was a joy to be able to dedicate each of Talia's older sisters, Abigail and Eleanor, to the Lord. And now we have the privilege on this Mother's Day of dedicating Talia unto the Lord. I would just, I'm just going to let the family uh sit right there so you don't have to stand up here during this this time and then we'll 
to let Brother Ben and Sister Beth bring to Leah later. Brother Ben and Sister Beth, you've been here before, twice. I'm not going to say all the things that I've said to you twice in the last few years, but I am going to uh, repeat a few remarks that I've said in the past, and then I just felt the Lord gave me something new to say to you for this special child. When God blessed your home with added a fresh, exciting, and there will be desperate days that were very uh, tension feel, filled with Talia. But all in all, it's going to be an incredible, rewarding, fulfilling chapter of your life as parents of three precious, God given daughters. As you have already discovered, there's nothing more fulfilling than parenting and nothing more demanding. It's one of life's great responsibilities, but it's one of life's greatest privileges. So when God gives children into a home, we know that we're being blessed of the Lord because the Bible lets us know that children are a heritage from the Lord. So what a privilege for you to present to Leah to the Lord in dedication on this special day. And how awesome it is that she is a sixth generation apostolic. Let's clap our hands. That's, that's awesome. First of all, we're going to enjoy getting to know baby Talia through a special, for those of you who don't know her already, through a special multimedia presentation right now.
Brother Ben and Sister Beth, through every stage to come of parenting this precious baby girl, the joys will outweigh the struggles, and you will survive triumphantly, and so will your precious children by God's grace and your continued efforts to train them up in the way of the Lord. I've told you before, and this bears saying again, it has been wisely observed that children do teach us the art of of unselfish love. I felt to tell you, Brother Ben and Sister Beth, at this dedication, that when the enemy has seemingly attempted to take a child out early in her life, it is usually an indication that God has some very special purpose for that child's life. As we met together with you and brother and sister Boren early that Sunday morning when Talia was struggling to breathe at the tender age of about two and a half to three weeks old from the severe RSV infection, even in the midst of the tenseness of those moments and that situation, we knew our great God was watching over this precious little girl now only time will tell the unique purposes God will have for Talia in his kingdom I want you to remember to tell her and then remind her again and again throughout her young life how God powerfully preserved her life in its very early stages let her know that when God says to a child that is so threatened, live. When a child is so tenuously close to death, that means God has a special place in his eternal purpose for her to fulfill. God will use the two of you to guide her skillfully into that designed and pre-planned place and purpose. Sister Walker's now coming. I imposed on my Jonathan and Lindsay and asked them to text me what helped you in your spiritual training. I didn't ask for any negatives because it's Mother's Day and I didn't want to hear that. I'm sure they both could have given me some, but just quickly. Jonathan said to treasure every moment as a gift. Invest in memories, spend time and money to invest in memories. To develop a love and an appreciation for the word and for God's house. And fourthly, to apply the blood of Jesus to your children every day. Lindsay said her parents were always consistent. They made sure God's work was the number one priority, not just in their lives, but in the lives of their children. They taught them that God's work was not really work, but a privilege. And they modeled submission to authority. I believe you're following through on all the advice that they felt had helped them in their life. But what the Lord asked me to share with you this morning, Beth and Ben, is from 1 Samuel chapter 2. We know the story of how Hannah prayed for a child. She was not able to have a child. God blessed her with Samuel. She gave him to the Lord all the days of his life. He lived from the age, most theologians believe, of two or three in the house of God. I'm simply going to quickly read parts of verses from 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 1. The child Eli ministered, or the child Samuel rather, ministered to the Lord before Eli the priest. Verse 18, Samuel ministered before the Lord, a child girded with a linen ephod. Verse 21, the child Samuel grew before the Lord. Verse 26, the boy Samuel grew and was in favor with the Lord and with men. Number five is in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1. Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. We take these five verses and put them together. We've got a very special child going here. He's living in the house of God. He ministers to the Lord. He ministers to Eli. He doesn't even have a home life. He lives in the house of God. So this child is surrounded by the presence of God. He helped to trim the golden candlestick. He was around the Holy of Holies. There could be a child with no greater advantage as far as spiritual things. Yet we know when the Lord calls Samuel and he was still just a boy, he did not recognize the voice of God. 
verse 7 says, Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord was not yet revealed to him. And the Lord calls Samuel then the third time. So verse 7 tells us, although this child was literally raised in the presence of God, around holy things constantly, at a certain age he did not yet know the voice of God. The Lord wants you to be encouraged as parents, because I know your Abby is getting to the age, your especially Abby ready to receive, that when it deal with a child, no matter how much, and now you have a wonderful home, you train your children in the ways of God, they never miss church. When it comes time, it will be a child. You can foster it, but you cannot call the child. God is very jealous over the salvation of each one of us and wants longingly for it to be a very personal experience. I just quickly will tell you the example from the only child I know, the only one I gave birth to, and that was Jonathan. He was five years old. It was New Year's Eve, and we had prayed with him from the age of three and, and, and hoped he would respond to the Lord and tried to do everything you're doing. But I was downstairs at New Year's Eve at midnight. I was fixing a little snack to eat because we had service till midnight in Cincinnati in those days and on uh, New Year's Eve. And we heard him weeping, sobbing in his room. And Marvin ran upstairs, thought he'd fallen, got hurt. What's wrong, Jonathan? He couldn't stop crying. We investigated. I laid the spatula down, went up. He was sitting on the side of his bed just sobbing all by himself. What's wrong? Oh, do you want to repent, honey? <gasps> but all alone, the Lord drew him. So you can foster, you can put him in the atmosphere, but when it comes time, God will speak to your children, and they will hear the because you've taught them to. He's very afraid of the water. He actually flunked to get baptized in class. He literally did. He didn't pass. He, didn't, he was so afraid of the water, he's like me. He didn't want to get his face wet. He's a great swimmer now, but... His mama never learned to swim. So we went through all that, trying to take away the fear of being put under the water. But when it was time and the Lord was ready for him to be baptized, we were simply reading the Easter story and he began to heave and sob once again. What's wrong, Jonathan? They called it doing a bob in those days when they had to go under the water. They said, the teacher said, do a bob at swim class. He said, well, I guess if Jesus did all that for me, I guess I could do one bob for him. But the Lord, we didn't say, you ought to get baptized. God called him. The night he got the Holy Ghost, I had prayed and prayed and prayed from the time he was born. Pastor had too. We're sitting behind with Lanny Wolf uh, trio when Lanny was with us and the church was full. I was sitting about four rows behind him. He was with all of his little, little friends sitting in front of me. And, and everybody started to gather around and it looked like something was happening. So I'm pushing through the crowd and I'm looking and here's my little boy. Uh, with no mama there, no daddy there with his hands raised, talking in tongues. I'm looking, at the, what is this? So we got in the car and I'm like, honey, tell mama what happened? Because I wasn't there to, you know, be what, I wasn't patting and urging and nothing. And he, he was just doing it. And then he said, well, Jesus talked to me. And I'm like, wow because <laughs> he'd always said he always talks to you guys he never says anything to me he was kind of offended that god never talked to him but anyway he said jesus talked to me i said what did he say this is a six-year-old he said jonathan you can worry about those boys laughing at you because he very much being an only child wanted to please his friends you can worry about those boys laughing at you or you could just raise your hands and i'll give you the holy ghost which one do you want he said, Mom, so I just thought, well, I guess I'll just raise my hands. He said, as soon as I did, I got them stammering tongues. But in every instance, it was God jealously drawing this child on his own. So keep doing all you're doing, Beth and Ben, but be at peace. God wants to save your children, and God will speak to them. And when it's the right time for each step of salvation, they will know it. It'll be a call of the Spirit because God wants to build a relationship with them. And that's the word of the Lord for you today. I would like for the family members to stand right now. Because baby dedications are as much parental dedications as they are baby dedications. And these parents are not just here to dedicate sweet Talia to the Lord, but they're once again dedicating themselves to the Lord as well to raise her in the nurture and admonition of the Word of God in reverence for the unchangeable Word of God. They're dedicating themselves to train Talia up in apostolic truth given in the Scriptures. They're dedicating and committing themselves to create in their home an atmosphere that Sister Walker was talking about that is conducive to worship and is conducive for God to be able to call each of these precious girls and Talia 
in his own way in his time unto himself now brother Ben and sister Beth will you accept this charge as parents before the Lord and these friends and family and this church family today would you just answer we will and will you four precious grandparents and aunts uncles cousins will you extended family members accept the charge to help these parents raise their daughter in the fear and admonition of the Lord and seek to help train her how to walk after God's spirit and in his truth will you answer we will wonderful now church family I want you to stand because Talia will be in Sunday school classes Talia will be in services Talia will be in the foyer. Talia will be in the multipurpose room. Talia will be on the church grounds. Talia will be surrounded by church family as well as natural family. So church family will have an impact on Talia's life also. So now we as a church family commit to do everything in our power to help these parents teach, train, and lead Talia and her precious sisters in the ways of the Lord by our examples in worship in our deeds in our conduct in our conversations in the halls the foyer the Sunday school classrooms the offices the multipurpose room outside the campus and when they're visiting in our homes will we commit to be encouragers of these parents and these girls in their continuing walks with the Lord. Will you all answer with me the words we will? We will. Amen. You may be seated. Except for Brother Ben and Sister Beth and Talia. If you'll now step up here. Dr. James Dobson, a focus on the family, has said that junior high is the time when life makes up his mind. So... You know, I did this for Abigail, and I did this for Eleanor, and we have done it for Talia. We have prepared a special gift that Sister Walker wants to give you. And the letter I am now reading, we are giving a copy of Earth because its ears has observed that life usually makes up its mind and begins to go in a positive direction or... Well, we don't even want to consider the other. So we present to you parents on this day of the dedication of Talia here at Faith Apostolic Church on Mother's Day, May 12, 2019, a letter that I'm going to read to you now that you will then read to her on her 12th birthday celebration. Dear Talia, happy 12th birthday. I'm writing this greeting to you the week before your parent-child dedication at Faith Apostolic Church of Troy, Michigan. As you read this letter, you're celebrating your 12th birthday. I hope today is a special day for you, covered with the blessings of God as you celebrate with friends and family. God blessed you with two very special parents. They prayed for you during your mother's pregnancy. At your dedication, we reminded your parents of their responsibility to provide for you a home in which Jesus Christ and his holy word are honored. I gave them a little container to keep in your room as you grow up. Inside, it has a white cloth heart with a mixture of substances, sweet cinnamon sugar to represent the sweet joys of life, a bitter herb called coriander to represent the times of sorrow and difficult that life brings, red sea salt to represent that as Christians, we are to be the salt of the earth. Yellow turmeric to remind us that we are the light of the world. The heart was drenched in an oil of frankincense and myrrh mixture to represent the spices that were given to baby Jesus so long ago, since our supreme goal should be to become more and more like Jesus. Talia, we prayed that you would grow up learning God's love and that one day you would repent, be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins and be filled with the Holy Ghost evidenced by speaking in other tongues just like the first century Christians of the book of Acts. What a legacy is yours. 
Now you're 12 years old. Your parents have made most of life's important decisions for you up until now. There's one decision only you can make, however. You alone must decide how to respond to God's love and God's call upon your life. If you've already been born again of the water and spirit, I pray that you will continue to grow as a Christian and that you will stay close to Jesus through your teenage years. If you have not yet been born again of water and spirit, I urge you to do so very soon. This has been our prayer for many years. God gives the best to those who leave the choice to him. God's gifts put our best dreams to shame. Talia, you can always trust God. May God bless you on this special birthday in the love of Jesus. Pastor Marvin Walker. <laughs> so precious. If you'll just bring Talia up here now, we have these gifts to give you. And we want the church to stand as we pray this dedicatory prayer. We'll just put those gifts right there by where you're sitting. Hi, sweet. Hi, sweet girl. I love you. Yeah. I'm going to pray for you now. Lord Jesus, first of all, I anoint Talia's head with oil because I pray that every day of her life, you will be guiding and directing her mind. Help her, Lord, to be responsive to your words and your mind, your ways, your statutes, your commandments, and not the ways of the culture around her. I'm praying that she will be able to cast down imaginations and everything that would exalt itself against your knowledge and Learn to have the mind of Christ, even at an early age. I'm anointing these hands, Lord, that everything she does in her life will be anointed and that she will understand that we are your workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. We don't earn our salvation by our works, but when we are truly touched by your saving grace, good works will follow in our lives and I pray for these hands that they will do everything that God that God you are calling to Leah to do in your purpose and Lord I anoint these precious little feet with these awesome bows on these shoes that I don't want to mess up so I'm going to put the oil right above them Lord I am praying that these feet will always walk in your paths that your word will be a lamp unto her feet and a light unto her path. That she will know your way and walk in your way and learn to love your way and delight in your way and delight in your law. Oh, Lord, let it be the expression of her heart what the psalmist said, Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. And let these feet always walk and follow in your paths. In your precious name, and I am praying for her that at the earliest possible age, your call will come to her in such a way that she will respond and obey the plan of salvation, identifying with your death at Calvary through repentance, identifying with you being placed in that tomb in a watery grave of baptism in the name of Jesus, and then identifying with your resurrection through being filled full of your own spirit in your precious name we pray Lord thank you Jesus thank you Jesus my sweet girl here she is folks this is God's special girl that he's kept his hand on in a very special way when her life was in a very precarious tenuous place God is faithful who has promised let's clap our hands to the lord bless you all praise god our ushers are coming right now 
and we're going to have a wonderful opportunity to worship the Lord through giving. And while the ushers are coming, let me just say, we are so thankful for all the family members that are here today. And uh, we are also thankful for all of our other guests that are here today. We want Faith Apostolic Church of Troy to be the friendliest church in Michigan, if possible. That's what we're working toward as a church family, that you will walk into this church and just feel the warmth of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ and know that you've walked into a place that will do everything we can do to affirm you and to just show you the wonderful ways of the Lord. Now, we, our tradition here is to march to give in the offering. There are other ways you can give. It's called Simple Give that you can give online. I don't know if they have that slide up, but uh, it's a way you can give online to the cause of the kingdom of the Lord. Precious Jesus, thank you for the way. We have so many manners to worship you in. Lord, to express our love and our appreciation, our thanksgiving for all that you are and all that you do. We love you and we want to walk with you. We want to serve you. We want to walk in faithfulness to you in every area of our life. And we thank you that allowing us to participate in giving a portion of what you have blessed us with in the first place back to the cause of your kingdom is one of the ways you've provided for us to worship you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. God, you are the God. 
you're still standing I just want to uh, introduce our Mother's Day speaker today and I I want to say that uh, some mothers uh, go through a little bit more than other mothers every mother is wonderful unique and precious and uh, Wow I am so thankful for what mothers can mean in our lives. Now, my son wrote a, an article for the Pentecostal Life magazine because the doctors wanted us to abort him because my wife was born with a condition called a hypoplastic womb. She was actually born with only one adrenal gland, one kidney, one tube, one ovary, and only half of a womb. She had been told by doctors she could never even conceive a child. But you know, we serve a great big God, and she married a guy who went down in the furnace room at the old building we had the second floor flat of in a midtown area of Cincinnati back in the years 1977 and, and uh, that husband she married went down and said now God I'm not going to belabor this but I'm just going to ask you that if you want to do a miracle I believe you can and, and we would love to have a, a child if not she grew up at the mansion and, and we could have been so thrilled to adopt a child you know the thing about being a parent isn't so much how that child comes into your life, but how you nurture that child after that child comes into your life. And so God just chose to give us the miracle. And when they wanted us to abort, we just said, you know, God has begun a miracle. We're just going to let God do another miracle. We found out just in the last week or so that Brother Justin's Rory's mother was by Sister Walker's bedside in the ABI dorm room when she actually died and went over to the other side and came back that night with Brother Norris holding her hand. And she came back to her body, heard the singing in a distance. He was leading the girls in that old song I see a crimson stream of blood that flows from Calvary aren't we glad for that crimson stream of blood aren't we thankful for the power of God that flows because of that blood and it brought her back from the other side because God wasn't finished with her yet he had much still to do through her life and then when the doctors wanted us to take the life of, of, of our, our child to save her life, we, we thought, well, God saved her life two times already. Actually, three times by then. We're going to trust him 
with this miracle he's begun. And my son wrote a whole article about how thankful he was that she was willing to go through that trauma when they told her from about the fourth or fifth month on, this baby could come any day, your womb will burst, the baby will drown, and we'll have five minutes to save your life. That's how she walked through the pregnancy. But at the end, the doctor who delivered him said, you might as well write miracle across this record. I have never, never seen a woman with a hypoplastic womb carry a child full term. She carried him nine months and three weeks and then had him normal and naturally. Our God's a big God, folks. He's a big God. So when I bring this precious wife of mine to this pulpit today, I give her great honor for 40 years ago plus going through all of that emotional trauma in order to bring a son into the world that's now preaching the gospel and, and a pastor in his own right. Let's thank the Lord for what he's doing. Praise the Lord, fact. I just want to remind you again about the gifts and the four-year presses. Sister D. Sheldon every year comes up with the most creative, beautiful little gifts for us. I, she was bringing them to the table. And I said, I got to leave as soon as I preach. Can I have one now? She helped me find a red one. They're test tubes. She put suction cups and created this beautiful wire. Mine's got an angel hanging on it. You can put a little flower right in your window, right? She's just so creative and amazing. It takes her a lot of time and a lot of work, and she uses her creative genius to bless us every Mother's Day. Let's give a hand to Dee Sheldon. Thank you, Sister Sheldon. You may be seated. Where is Linda Booker Rory? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. When Sister Rory texts me that you're going to be here today, I'm like, say what? That is so amazing. We went to school together many years ago, and it's so good to have you with us here today. Um, to our graduates, we had 12 graduates from Purpose Institute, six high school graduates, that's 18. In my week that was impossible because circumstances happened with Sister Sandra's son the week before, I was trying to do about eight days worth of work in four days and didn't get around to getting your gifts put together. I've actually bought them, but not put together and not the cards. I could have signed, love Brother Sister Walker, but I didn't want to do that. I wanted to write in your cards. So graduates, you've not been forgotten by your pastor and his wife, which is that your gifts will be after I get home from Europe with all my sweet things written in your cards. So I honor you and I will be getting your gifts to you. They're sitting right by my bedside. So that's the first task I will do when I get home. I want to share with you uh, a scripture has nothing to do with what I'm going to preach about, but the Lord told me to read it to you. First Samuel chapter 30, verse 24. To put it in context, this is when David's um, family was taken from Ziklag, and part of the men went to uh, get the families back and get their uh, livestock back. And some of them had to stay and watch the stuff, watch the baggage. Verse 24. David is explaining how that they're going to share in the spoils of the battle, the ones who stayed behind. For as is the share of him who goes into the battle, I'm in the Amplified, so shall his share be who stays by the baggage, they shall share alike. And from that day to this, it's made a statute and an ordinance in Israel. The Reader's Digest version is, Pastor and I are going to battle. I know we're going to battle because the devil's been so mad this week. I haven't had a kidney infection in ages. I spoke yesterday at a lady's tea for sister, sis trunk in Plymouth. And by the time I got home, my fever was so high. I was so sick. I had to go to bed uh, with kidney infection. And I thank you for praying, Sister White. Thank you for putting the prayer band call out. I have low-grade fever, but it's not high today so I can function. Pastor came home with a dying car, sick with bronchitis. And I'm like, okay, devil, you're just showing yourself up. This means God's going to do good things. So you've got to endure hardness as a good soldier and just go forward. But I'm here to tell you, we're going to Belgium and Scotland to minister at the call of the Lord. We're not looking for something to do in our old age people. God called us to do this. There's not a lot of fun in the equation. At the end, pastor's going to take me away for a few days for our anniversary. But we're doing this to obey the plan that you know, nobody's this with for having poor stand of walking in a bag, as it says, the last will be very shocked. The throne of God about him stood, we're gone, God. So please, well, we just pray. If you 
what we're going through now, but keep praying feel good it so we'll have strength to minister the word of God I got a prophecy from Eli Hernandez I got a prophecy from Jason Cisco yesterday or we did concerning this work and he said Wesley's revival Jason said Wesley's revival is over in Europe it's time for the revelation of the oneness of God to come to the ministers in Europe Eli said something God had shown him so we are breaking into territory and going forth and not just this campus there are 24 campuses so pray for all of the uh, campuses that will be going on in those four nations of Europe, Germany, Austria, Belgium, and Switzerland, I believe. Uh, and I just want to thank you and let you know that it's we're a team. We're in this together. Every day you fast, every day you pray. You are maybe fasting and praying for one of the greatest evangelists that maybe has ever been in, in, in Europe. We don't know. God may raise up some of these students that we're going to teach that will just the name of Jesus and the mighty name of, of uh, the oneness of God will go across many, many places. This is uh, an assignment in the Lord, and I just wanted to tell you that. Also, when I minister, uh, finish ministering, uh, we'll see how the Lord concludes at the end, but Pastor and I will be going out that door. I'd love to hug everybody, but we do not have time. We're going to have to go in the office, put on traveling clothes, and Brother Brandon's going to take us to the airport. The Lord gave me a vision many years ago. I was asking him for something new to share with you on Mother's Day, and he informed me early in the week that you have never shared the vision with them that I shared recently, Michigan Mantle, I apologize to Beth and Ben and to Brandon and Laura, because this is going to be a second time for them in a few weeks. But I realized in looking at my notes, I'd never shared that vision with you. And I know some of you have been struggling in an area that I'm going to talk about today. I know it in the spirit. And I'm asking the Lord to anoint when I share with you this vision that it'll give you a fresh view. The title of this message is A View of Prayer from the Throne of God. Would you say that with me? A view of prayer from the throne of God. How many of you, when you make New Year's resolutions, if you still do that, somewhere on there, it's, I'm going to pray more. Anybody? Oh, yeah, me too. I mean, every year it's going to be, I'm, I'm going to do better. I'm going to be more consistent. I'm going to add more time. I'm going to fast more. We, we just do that. I quit making New Year's resolutions, Gavin, because about March they're kind of going downhill, you know. So I quit making them because I break them so often, Brother Chris. I'm like, oh, please, God. But, but in my spiritual goals and wanting to do better, I think we all say, God, I'm, I'm going to get in a deeper level of prayer. How many just honest enough to admit, you, you desire right now, I want a deeper, I do, I'm 68, I want a deeper level, I want to know God better. So we make these, we make these attempts when I was 12 years old, you've probably heard me tell this story before, but there was a 24-hour prayer chain going on at the church, and uh, pastor's family fills in the slots, and so we were a smaller church, and there were slots left, and there was a, a prayer slot from 5 to 7 in the morning. I was only 12 years old, Sister Boren. But I told my dad, because I just heard Vesta Mangan preach. Vesta Mangan can convince that pew it can, it can pray an hour. She, she could talk that pew into praying an hour. I really believe she could. So she had talked me into the fact that I was a mighty prayer warrior. I mean, she just made me believe. <laughs> I came home going, oh. So I'm a like, dad, you got me from five to seven. I'm a night owl. I go to bed now, a little bit different now in my old age. But in those days, I'd go to bed at 12 or 1. And in the morning, mom and dad have to be shake me to get me out of bed because I was not a morning person. So to get me up at 7 was a feat. And now I'm going to get up at 5 and pray right. But anyway, I set the clock. I got up at 5. I'm going downstairs. I've got my Bible. And I'm armed and dangerous. And I knelt down by the couch and I'm... I prayed. I prayed my heart out. I prayed for everybody I knew. I prayed for every mansion child. I prayed for everybody in the church, the few missionaries I knew, and, and I blessed everything, and I just, I did it all. And I was tired. I looked up at the clock, and it was 5.15. I had said everything I had to say to God in 15 minutes. I had an hour and 45 minutes to go, Sister Angie. I'm like, what am I going to do now? I'll just start over. Oh, God, bless them mansion kids. Jesus, help. You know, that's all I knew to do. I knew nothing much about prayer, but I was sincere. And at 7 o'clock, Mom was shaking me. So somewhere between 5.15 and 5.30, I'd gone to sleep. She said, Claudette, wake up. It's time to go to school. I'm like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So they shortened my prayer time. But, but anyway, we all have a desire to pray. Now, if we desire to pray, I have a question to ask you. Why the struggle? Why is it so stinking, I'm sorry, hard? Sometimes, just to discipline yourself to get to that new level. I asked the Lord that once, and he showed me. He gave me a vision in the spirit, and I'm going to share it with you today, of what our attempts to come into the throne room looked like from his point of view. Okay? The Lord allowed me to come up and stand beside him. He was on the throne on a raised dais. I was standing over to the right, and I was watching this whole scenario. The throne room was long, beautifully carpeted, gorgeous inside, and in front 
at the end of the prayer room or throne room, there were gold doors, not gold plated, solid gold doors, about 20 foot tall. They were closed. And then all of a sudden, because God can do what he wants, I could see through those doors out in the hallway. And I would watch as several different women were making an attempt to get into the throne room to seek the face of God. And here's what happened. First, I saw a lady. She was making an attempt to come in, but she couldn't. She was pushing on the door. She couldn't get the door open. There was a demon standing right in front of the door. He was very handsome, this demon. He looked like a normal man. He was very bewitching. And as she was pressing her way and had every intention to pray, he had something in his hand called a calendar, or in the old days, a day timer. And he goes, oh, excuse me, I know you want to pray, but do you remember what you have to do this week? So-and-so really needs a visit in the hospital. Why don't you write that down? I think you need to call so-and-so or text so-and-so or whatever so-and-so. Oh, yeah, I got, oh, my. And remember how your car's been acting up? You need to, whatever. He just began to get a barrage of things to her, good things to do, not bad things, but things to do. And she just became overwhelmed. And she got the paper, and she began to write down, and she'd try to get in, and then she'd think of something else she ought to do, whatever. And, and eventually, she just started to walk away because she just felt overwhelmed. I really don't have time to pray. I've got all this good stuff to do. And God bless you, Lord. I love you. But she just started to make her way away from the throne room when all of a sudden, on the other side, that was on the left side of the door, on the right side, I saw an angel. There was an angel standing there, and the angel was very tall, was very handsome, looked also like a man. This one didn't have wings, and was reading from the Bible. The angel was simply reading out loud. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the works of the flesh? And then he began to read from Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And then he whispered to her and said, The password to get in is not your good works. The password to open the door is grace. And she stopped and she laid her book aside and she said, I'm not going to enter by my good works or all the things that I have done. I am asking in the name of Jesus right now for this door to the throne room to open by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And those huge doors just swung right open. And she started walking boldly up to the throne of grace. For the invitation comes loud from God's point of view. Listen to the Lord as he quoted this verse. I heard him in the very beginning, I forgot to say this, of the vision, quoting Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. And he's speaking as if he's speaking to us. For you have not an high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of your infirmities. For I was in all points tempted like as you are, yet without sin. Therefore, come boldly. Come boldly to the throne of grace that you may come and get mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. What an invitation. The Lord himself saying, come boldly to the throne of grace. I have something for you. I have mercy. I have grace to help you. But it's the enemy's job to pervert it and to twist it and put the slightest whatever on it to keep us from going in and really entering into the presence of God. But God is calling us. We've been in England several times. And I've always wished when I stood at the gates of Buckingham Palace and those beautiful gates there and watched the honor guard do their thing and, and all that and changing of the guard and stuff that just for some reason that they would say, Claudette Walker, Queen Elizabeth understands you're here this afternoon. She would like to invite you for high tea at 2 o'clock. Well, that never happened. When Princess Di was alive, oh my goodness, I thought her clothes were so pretty. And I really wanted her to invite me to tea. But I would stand at those gates and wait, Brother Ray, and just hang around. Nobody ever invited me. There ain't no way anybody's ever going to invite Claudette for tea at the Buckingham Palace with the royals. It probably just ain't going to happen. But just think what I just read to you. Forget that. The King of kings and the Lord of lords every day of my life says, Claudette, come boldly to the throne of grace. Come and find grace to help in the time of need. I'm inviting you. I'm I'm the King of Kings. I'm the Lord of Lords. I want to give you a private audience, but you're going to have to fight all that junk in the hallway. If you're ever going to get in here, you're going to have to listen to the Word of God and know the passwords. And the first password going against our good works is the grace of God. See, sometimes those to-do lists can work against us. 
I remember one time a young lady telling me she was a minister's wife and she said that it was near Christmas time and she was praying and she was reading her list to God she said oh Lord here's what I got to do I've got that children's musical I've got this decorations I've got to do and then I got to bake some cookies for that bazaar and I've got to do this and she read him her whole long list of all good things to do and all for the church and all for the community she was just reading and I don't know how I'm going to go through this God and I got these two little kids and oh Lord please help me oh Jesus I got to do this and this and she kept reading him her list and in the middle of reading it to him he interrupted her and said Chris she said yes Lord he said you can do all that if you want to I won't stop you but I didn't ask you to do half of it every good work is not a God work and I believe with all of my heart, if Satan can keep us, Brother Baker, from the throne of God, from a deep prime of personal interaction with God, where I am letting God's spirit flow through me, and I'm becoming more like God, and I'm hearing directives from God, he'll let me do good works all day long, because those good works won't save me. It is only by the grace of God that I am saved. And he's not looking for somebody to do good works. He's looking for somebody to have an intimate, close, personal relationship with. It's a bridegroom looking for a bride. That's that's who we're talking about. Uh, Sister Walker just preached. We ain't supposed to do nothing good. Nobody's going to sign up for anything anymore. That's not what I'm saying. Of course, good works will follow our having been in the throne room. But we need to let God say what it is we're to do and what we're not to do. Because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. I had a list longer than both arms. Well, me with my health issues, I've been battling a kidney infection. When I drove home from Livonia yesterday, my fever was so high. I don't know how I made it through the traffic and made it home. I don't know. So a lot of the things that I had on my list for yesterday, I knew they're just laid aside. Okay, God, what is it you're saying I need to do tonight to get ready to go to Europe? What are you asking me to do? What is the call of your spirit? That's why we've got to walk in the spirit and not fulfill just the lust of our flesh. The lust of your flesh is not always bad and evil. Sometimes the lust of your flesh is making yourself feel good about yourself because, bless God, you just put in 32 hours of work in a 24-hour day. Hallelujah. Well, God bless you, sweetheart. But how much of it did God ask you to do? How much of it was really beneficial for the kingdom? How much of it caused others and you to grow into the likeness of Christ? Oh, it's quiet here. Ain't nobody saying amen. I watched as the second lady begin to try to... I could see through the doors. The doors are closed again, but I could see through in the hallway as God can. And she was trying to get to the door to come into the throne room. But there was a demon standing there, and this one didn't look nice. He had a really ugly look on his face. Mr. Ginger, if you'll come and help me, I'm going to be the demon because I don't want to ask anybody to be the devil. So I asked Sister Ginger to be the good lady who's trying to get into the throne room. Okay, now watch her. There's the door. The door's toward Pastor, and you're... But here I am. I ain't Sister Walker. I'm a devil. And the name of myself is condemnation. Would you say that with me? Condemnation. And he's going like, Ginger, you know you had a disagreement with so-and-so at work. You remember that? Who do you think you could go in there? I saw you the other day when you had a bad motive. I remember you haven't forgiven so-and-so because she cut your heart out. I know you're struggling with a bad attitude, and you just stay out of here. And you don't, you don't need to go in there. And you're just getting more and more discouraged. You're like, yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're right. And she's starting to turn away. She's like, I don't guess I should pray. Who am I to pray? I've got all those things. I've got all those sins. That is the object of condemnation is to get us away. And then there's sometimes when the devil's not around, I'm going to let you beat yourself up, that Sister Walker helps him out. I am the devil best helper with this deal of condemnation he doesn't have to beat me up very long I'll help him out I beat myself up oh you didn't pray enough you didn't fast enough oh my god sister Walker you should have called so-and-so you had a bad attitude the other day you just I just talked myself out of a trip into the throne room by beating myself up and telling myself how bad I am and what I've done I don't need to help the devil out he's good enough at it but I hate that spirit of condemnation because it keeps you from an intimate relationship with God God does convict us of sin but he does not condemn us conviction says the angel standing there looking at ginger in just a minute I got to get my notes because I ain't memorized this yet standing there and saying I want you to have boldness ginger to enter into the holiest by something called the blood of Jesus now you're wrong granted but I'm going to give you a pass and I'm going to show you how you can get in Look at her. 
Look at her. Yeah, she's messed up. So do I every single day. But she's covered with the blood of Jesus. Now put your hands on the door and just push your way in. By the blood of Jesus Christ, by the holiest, holiest. She's invited to the throne room because God forgives us of our sins. He forgives us of our sins. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. Save me. One day when I was lost, I died upon Jesus, died upon the cross, and I know it was the blood. Save me. You're never going to get in because you have a perfect record. The only way you're ever going to get into the throne room is by the blood of Jesus Christ. So you declare the blood over yourself. I don't care what you just did. I don't care what sin you just sinned. You put the blood over yourself and say, I enter by the blood, and the door will swing wide open. And you rush to the throne. Thank you, Sister Ginger. Thank you so much. I'll let you babysit that till I get home. Just take care of it. My mama made it. Woo, hallelujah. Let's thank God for the blood. I'm sorry, but that was pitiful. Stand up and thank God for the blood. If you are thankful that you can enter, clap for him. Give him praise. None of us have access to God, but by the blood of Jesus. Lord, I thank you for dying for my sins. I thank you that you don't condemn me. I thank you that you invite me by your blood to come to the throne of God. You may be seated. Romans 8, 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. No condemnation. Conviction, that beautiful angel who was standing there reading about the blood of Jesus from Hebrews 10, 19, having therefore boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Will state your sin. Conviction will draw you toward the throne and lead you to hope, not despair. Condemnation nags, repels, and leads to despair. It nags, it repels, it leads to despair. My nature, as you know, is melancholy. Melancholies tend to be, it's kind of dumb, because none of us can be perfect, but we have a perfectionist tendency. The Lord asked me on my 40th spiritual birthday, I was looking at 20 years worth of notebooks of just my study of the Word of God. He said, how do you see your journey? How do you see the last 20 adult years you've walked with me, Claudette? And I see a giant continuum like this, Lord. Sometimes I teach a home Bible study and I'm nice, and other times I'm just lazy and want to read a novel. Sometimes I really pray a long time, and then sometimes it's just perfunctory. Sometimes I'm really nice and forgiving to people, and sometimes I just want to slap somebody silly. And sometimes I just, yeah, me too. You know, highs and lows, highs and lows, highs and lows. Anybody else see your Christian life that way? Is there anybody like this? If you're like that, I'm going to come join your tra trajectory because mine ain't like that. Mine's kind of like this. And sort of all over the map. But this I drew for him like that. He said, would you like to know what we, not the Trinity, but me and the angels, <laughs> see up here? I'm going to treat you on the oneness, not the Trinity. I said, yes, Lord, I'd like to know. And I saw this continuum up here were the highs, the good things I'd done, the good words I'd said down here is all my bad stuff. He took a giant eraser. I just saw his hand. He took a giant eraser and he erased the whole bottom part of the continuum. He said, do you believe in the power of repentance? That's what he asked me, Brother Herring. I'm like, well, sure, Lord. He said, well, you just confused me. I don't even remember all that stuff you're talking about on the bottom. Up here in heaven, we wipe it away when you repent. All we have re recorded up here are the good words you've ever said, the hugs you've given, the cards you've written, the Bible studies you've taught, all the good things you've done, all your quests toward God. That's all we have up here are peaks of victory. We see you as victorious. We see you as triumphant in Christ. Happy birthday, Claudette. 
We don't judge our children by all their failures. We correct them. We teach them how to do better. Then on their birthday, hopefully David doesn't get a card from his mom saying, David, I remember when you were 14 and you did whatever. And when you were 11, you told a lie to me, bless God. And I ain't never forgot that child. And no, no. No, I don't know if David ever did any bad stuff. He's so sweet. Who knows? But anyway, his mama knows. But, but anything he ever done, maybe that wasn't right, she doesn't write about it in the card. No, she writes, oh, David, you're such an admirable young man. You're such a faithful young man. You're such a, well, where did she get that? She got it from her heavenly father he doesn't look at us as failures he doesn't look at your weaknesses he doesn't look at your mistakes he looks at your peaks of victory if you walk in repentance hallelujah 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 i saw one more lady trying to get into the throne room She had her hands on the door. She was trying to get in. But this demon, who was very good looking, he was handsome, he was charismatic, he had an incredible personality, a very sympathetic personality. He walked up to her and said, as she's pressing her way into the throne room, he said, how are you feeling today? Now, we women, we usually like to talk about our feelings. So that was a buzzword for her. She's like, well, to be perfectly honest, you won't believe what I've been going through lately. And he said, well, come and sit with me. I have for you a cup of tea. What is it, sweetheart? And they sat down at a little tea table right in front of the throne room door. What's going on in your life? They're sipping. Well, and mind you, she doesn't know who he is. Well, I've been praying about something for so long. And it's just getting worse. I mean, God's doing nothing. I think he's deleted me out of his contact list. So he's not been treating you good lately, right? No. Sister Walker, that's crazy. It ain't crazy. It happened in the Garden of Eden. He went up to Eve and said, Hey, sweetheart, let's have tea. How come you can't eat of that tree over there? Well, I'm not sure why, but he said we couldn't. We can eat all the others now. It's a good deal. Look at all these others we can eat of, but we can't eat of that one. He said, if we do, we'll die. So I ain't going to eat of it. Oh, really? I have an inside scoop on that. You won't die. You will be like God. And he's a killjoy. He's trying to keep something good from you, honey. And that's the beginning of the spiral downward. And he still does it. He offers it to us. I've been noticing on Instagram, sweetheart, that your friend that lives down in Louisiana looks like she's got some new dresses. You haven't had a new dress in a long time, have you? No. I saw she got to go to Disney World with her family. You can afford that, can you? No. Self-pity. Demon of self-pity. Demon of making us feel bad about how God's treating us. Oh, that'll keep you away from the throne. The Lord told me these three things are the Satan's, not his only ways, but his three biggest tools to keep us out of the throne room of God. And you listen to him long enough, and he'll convince you not to go in there. He'll say, darling, you know what I think. God would understand. You just need a nap. Just go take a nap. You know that new movie came out? PG, nothing wrong with it. God likes those. Just go watch a PG movie. Go get a Starbucks, honey. You need a chocolate. You're just having a bad day. Just go on, go on. And we listen to him, and we go to the movie, and we go eat our chocolate, and we go to Starbucks, and we're gone, and, and the help's right here at the throne. And on the other side, I saw the angel of God standing, and he was very tall and strong, and he had eyes that could look right through you. His name was Faith. He was reading from Hebrews 10, verses 21 and 22. And having an high priest, let us draw near to God with a true heart, full of assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. And he whispers to her, don't listen to him. Don't listen to those bad feelings about God. Don't let Satan lie to you about God or about your life. Stand up tall and wide and say, I'm entering the throne of God by faith in the word of God. And as soon as she said faith, the door swung right open and she walked boldly up to the throne. You got to fight your way into the throne room. You've got to fight bad feelings. You've got to realize that the enemy is going to come against you every way he can. He's going to make you feel like you got the heaviest load on your back anybody ever had. Oh, poor you. 
Honey, you're just too tired. You don't need to go in there. Yes, you do need to go in there. You need to go in there with all your baggage. You need to carry it right up to the throne of God. And you need to lay it down at his feet. Because he's up there saying, come, cast your care upon me. Because I care for you. He wants you to come in heavy laden. And then he wants you to leave free, standing upright. The devil wants you to carry it away and keep dealing with it. Faith says, bring it in here. Lay it down. Faith is not based on how you feel. Faith is based on what God guarantees in his word. So we need not to listen to the demon of good works. We need to use the password of grace. Everybody say grace. We need not to listen to the demon of condemnation. We need to use the password of the blood. Say the blood. We need not to listen to those bad negative feelings about God or about ourselves. We need to listen to the password and use the password of faith. Everybody say faith. Now I'm going to give you a test. Grace, blood, faith. Say it again. Grace, blood, faith. Those are the three passwords that every day you need to stand in front of the throne of grace and open the doors wide and come boldly and have an audience with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. If not, he'll talk you into it long enough till you spiral your way down to absolute destruction. That's his ultimate goal. And every day he can keep us away. The draw and the desire and the pull to come is less and less and less and less. And that's why we must press our way into the throne room. Now, here's why. Here's the good news. Everybody say, here's the good news. In the spirit, I watched as these ladies and people, men included, begin to come into the throne room before God. We're just going to use one lady for an example. I watched one lady. The throne is here. God's watching her. She's come through the door using blood, grace, and faith. I'm standing over here just watching the whole scenario. This is the reason God loves it when we come to the throne. It's prayer from his point of view. He watches as this lady begins to raise her hands and say, Lord, in spite of whatever, I bless your name. I love you, Lord Jesus. You are altogether lovely. You are faithful and you are true. She puts a little dance in her step and she begins to worship and swing and pray and praise. And I saw the Lord go... Her worship to him is a sweet smelling savor. And I watched as he enjoyed. He enjoyed. How many of you, come on, many of you enjoy it when somebody says something nice about you? Raise your hand right now. You know you do. I love it. I love it when you send me a card, say you love me and you think I'm nice. I love it when you hug me and say something sweet about me. And you love it when I say it about you. We're made that way. Where did we get it, Tim? We got it from a God who loves it when we, you're lovely. He gets enough bad rap in the world. He gets cursed often enough. But to have a saint of God come in and enter with worship and enter with love and enter with blessing makes God's day. He's like, oh, I love this. I love this. I love this. The Bible says he seeks such to worship him in spirit and in truth. The second thing I saw is she began to address her sins. She began to enumerate those sins that Ginger came in with and we all come in with and I heard the Lord say to her from Isaiah 118 as she began to enumerate her sins to him, which we should. Confess our sins, and he'll be faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And the Lord is saying, Isaiah 118, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be like crimson, they shall be like wool. Whiter than snow whiter than snow lord wash me and i shall be whiter than snow and i saw sins she did commit written on her record hope but as soon as she said lord would you forgive me one more time brother hager he didn't say i don't know let's check the records this one is case i don't know 
angels, should we or should we not? There is no conference call. There is no getting together to decide, Rebecca. You know what the Lord says every time, sweetheart, Sister Walker, 68, had the Holy Ghost 62 years. Every time I do something wrong and I say, Lord Jesus, would you forgive me? Without exception, he says, yes, I will. The blood of Jesus will wash your sins away, Claudette. And he washes her old dirty heart, got white as snow. And that gave God such joy because it let him know, David, what he did on the cross was not in vain. Somebody was taking him at his word and saying, come to the cross and let me wash you. Not just once, but every day. And then he knew his sacrifice was not in vain. And it blessed his heart to know that somebody took him up on his offer. The third thing I saw, she had that heavy, heavy load. And she came in with it and said, Lord, it's awful heavy. And he said, honey, just cast it down. Cast all your cares right here. I care for you. I'll work on them one at a time. I don't want you walking around heavy laden, honey. Nothing would hurt Sister Patty worse than if she, she keeps Wyatt and Addison. If, if she said, Wyatt, I want you to go carry that 50-pound load of bricks out there for Uncle David. He's going to be working on whatever. And poor little thing. He's trying. And trying to obey his nana. But he can't. He's not. He's too little. And we're too small to carry heavy, heavy loads. We're just not equipped to do it. But when the Lord says, come and cast them all on me, I care for you. We love it when our children have lives that they can do that are doable and accomplishable. And when they can, ah, very good. Go pick up your toys, Addison. He can do that. He feels good about himself, and she feels good about what she told him to do. God won't put on us more than we can bear. He won't let the cares press us down. We're the ones who let the cares press us down. Sister Walker's the one who refuses to lay them down, and I keep carrying them as if I can somehow take care of them anyway when I know I can't. And then I saw the Lord just smile when he saw her come in so heavy laden, and then she's stretching, and ah, whew, it feels better. <laughs> I wasn't made to carry that load. He said, no, you weren't. I'm the burden bearer. Leave it there. Just leave it there. Bring your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. If you'll trust and never doubt, he will surely bring you out. Just bring your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. Because he's good at what he does. He's the burden bearer. Nothing thrills us as parents and when we can help our children. And I saw the pleasure God gets from lifting the load off of us. The fourth thing I saw her begin to intercede. She began to cry out to the Lord. She began to ask God for people. She was praying for a backslider. Oh God, so-and-so's backslidden. Would you please help them, oh God? And I saw the Lord as the thousands of angels gathered around the throne and he would speak to an angel. I want you to go to right now to so-and-so's house. I want you to disturb that backslider in their sleep. I want you to wake them up at the night and I want you to talk to them and the angels. Phew, off and gone on assignment and then she begins to pray for a saint that's discouraged lord so-and-so's load so heavy right now her husband's sick and things aren't going well at her job and blah 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 and all going on god would you please help and the lord said sure angel i want you to go with a vial of comfort to so-and-so address and i want you to pour it into that poor lady's spirit who's going through more than can imagine and that lady doesn't know why but all of a sudden her spirit just begins to be encouraged because somebody just came from the throne and lifted a load and began to pour oil into her torn and broken heart she doesn't even know who prayed may never know who prayed but the work is being done the work of intercession and God and this lady are working together and the angels and it's a powerful thing no greater work goes on in the kingdom than intercession somebody has a tangled mind Lord right now their their mind is troubled and tangled and webbed and oh God would you please help them Lord yes angel go right now in the name of Jesus I want you to speak a message to that person a message of clarity a message of understanding let them know what they ought to do in that situation let it be so clear in the angel off and gone and all of a sudden this person's in their house just oh it's just a tangled web they don't know what to do and all of a sudden like just wow it's as clear as clockwork first you do A then you do B then you do C that's what I do and that person may never have known what went on in the heavenlies and that other intercessor that was crying out to God and the angels that were working with them. Oh, people, there's nothing more important than what happens at the throne of God. There's no important work on the earth that takes place at the throne of God. Intercede before the throne. Intercede for each other. Powerful heavenly things are done. And I saw how the Lord was blessed because his people were being blessed because this lady prayed. The fifth thing I saw, she had her book out. She was trying to figure out a strategy for her day, what to do. And the Lord's telling her, you don't have to be ignorant of Satan's devices. I'm going to show you the snares to avoid. I'm going to show you how to circumvent the enemy. I'm going to teach your hands to war. I'm going to show you what to do. I'm going to be your GPS today. 
You've heard me sing it before, but I happen to like this little song. Lord Jesus, be my GPS today. Show me, Lord, the way to go. Help me listen and obey as I go my way. Lord, be my GPS today. Take your day timer. Take your notebook. Take your daily planner near the throne room. Let him fill it out. You'll get more done than you could ever imagine. And the junk you didn't have to do, it won't get done. But God will show you what to do and where to go, and he'll direct your day according to his will and purpose and plan. And God was pleased because her load was bearable when she left. And then I saw her pick up the word as she knelt before the throne and she began to read. Always read the word when you pray. She's reading the word. She's studying the word. And God has given her godly confidence when she reads, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's like he hooked her up to an IV and all of a sudden strength, strength is coming into her. Strength is coming into her. Instructions are given to her. Warnings are given to her. Promises are given to her. As she ingests this word, her faith begins to grow. And the muscles in her arms I saw begin to grow, getting stronger and stronger and stronger. You have as much faith in God as you have in direct proportion to how much time you read this, you ingest it, you memorize it, and you live it. It's that simple. If you want more faith in God, you've got to spend more time in this book. You've got to love it. You've got to live it. You've got to highlight it. You've got to mark it. You have got to digest it. And the people you know that you admire, that you consider spiritual giants, the only difference in them and me is they've got more word in them than I do. And that's why I'm on a quest every day to ingest more of this word so I can get stronger in God too. The seventh thing I saw was her submissively laying down preferably on the rock of Gethsemane and saying, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. And he smiled because he found a like-spirited person. Ah, Tiffany, he said, I can be yoked with her. She's not about her ideas. She's not about what she wants. She's not about what she thinks. She's not about what she demands. She's all saying, not my will, but thine be done. That's the prayer I prayed in the garden right before I died. This lady's right on the way to her death and resurrection's about to come to her because she is yoked with me, the meek and lowly Christ who did not ask for my will, but submitted my will to the will of the Father. The work that God ensues and longs to do in your life hinges on how much time you spend in Gethsemane, dying to what you think, what you want. To be perfectly honest, I had to repent to pastor last night. I came in, told him I was wrong. He came in, he's telling me the horrible story about the car who's nigh into death. My car's 16 years old, his is 14 years old. And both, uh, Zach's hanging in there pretty good, but his car's nigh into the graveyard. And he was sick, he had fever. I had fever, I had a kidney infection. And I said, honey, this honest confession, a peep in the Walker's household. I said, honey, you know what? Maybe this should be our last one of these here missions overseas, you know. You're 71, I'm 68. Maybe those, we should become the intercessors and let the young folks go do whatever, you know. He, he, he didn't listen. When I'm in that, whatever, he just, he just kept packing. And I went upstairs and woke up this morning like, honey, I'm sorry, I apologize. If I'm 95 and God says go by the grace of God, I'll hobble on the plane and do what he says. Because in spite of what my flesh would rather do, which is stay home with y'all, and go buy my flowers tomorrow. Sister Hanson, I always buy my flowers on this Monday. And those flowers are going to be right picked over in three weeks. I'd rather do that in my flesh. But in greater than my flesh, I want to do what he wants me to do. Because someday, Brother Rory, when I stand in front of him, he can't say, well done, Claudette, thou good and faithful servant, if I've not done well. How does a servant do well? He does what he's asked, when he's asked, for as long as he's asked, with a good attitude, and no flack back. So I had to get up this morning and lay down on my sheepskin rug. I got in New Zealand when I was sick as a dog over there and going, oh, God, I'm sorry. Lord, if you make me live in this sick body until the day I die and I have to push every ounce of myself to do whatever, I'll do it, God, because someday I want you to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Oh, it pleases the Lord when we come into the throne room with an attitude of whatever you want, Lord. And last of all, I watched her as she knelt. It's for you, precious Sister Angela. I so respect Angela being here today. Pastor and I sent her a text. It's your first Mother's Day without Anthony. Alex is in jail for a while. She wrote back Rebecca and said, I appreciate it, Sister Walker, but Rebecca wants to come be with me on Mother's Day, so I'll be in church. I don't know how to pray for you, Angela Gerth, a lot of times. I don't know how to pray for Sandra Manning, who's bearing her boy this week. 
I'm not quite sure what words. I don't have pretty enough words to come up to help ease the agony of these mothers. But I can groan, and I do that. Oh, 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 oh. I do that, Sister Angela. And I cry, and my tears fall on my sheepskin rug. And, and then when I can't think about it, it just... There are no English words for what you're going through. What would you say? I have no idea. But the Spirit was praying through me in perfection for Angela Gerth and for Rebecca and for Ginger and for Alex and for Sandra and for her children whose hearts are broken because their 44-year-old brother died. I don't know what I said. And the best thing you can do when you get in there, if you can't come up with anything else to do is let the spirit pray through you the spirit prays in perfection romans 8 26 and 27 likewise the spirit also help with our infirmities for we know not we should pray for as we ought but the spirit itself will make intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered and he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the spirit because he maketh intercession for the saints According to the will of God. And Sister Sandra, if you see this later, and Sister Angela, you don't have to come up with pretty words right now. Your tears, he's catching in a bottle. He's writing them in a book. Your tears are a language God understands. Your silences, he reads. Let's just entertain the spirit. Just a minute, I'm almost done. I hear the call of your spirit going out. Come, my people. Come, come daily. Come off and live. Live with me in the throne room. Live with me in the holy of holies. I had surgery on my kidney. I was in the hospital five weeks in um, St. Louis. And Sister Tenney was my Sunday school teacher then. I asked her for a good book that I could give a patient across the hallway. He was dying with cancer, a teenage boy. She recommended this called Come Away, My Beloved. It's by a lady named Frances Roberts. God spoke messages to her that she thought were just for her. But the Lord told her in the later years to publish them for the body. So not equate the Bible. These are simply words of the Lord like we would record on our tape when the prophecy or tongues interpretation goes forth. But I want to read this to you in closing. Here's why the Lord wants us to pray. Here's why the Lord wants us to come into the throne room. It's called, I seek to lift thy load. Seek me early. Seek me late. Seek me in the middle of your day. You need me in the early hours for direction and guidance and my blessing upon your heart. You need me at the end of the day to commit into my hands the day's happenings, both to free yourself of burdens and to give them over into my hands so I can continue to work things out. And you need me more than ever in the busy hours, for in the activities and responsibilities so I can give my grace to you, my peace and my wisdom. I do not ask you to come to the throne room with the intention of placing a burden upon you and asking you to do so. Rather than adding something else to your life, I'm seeking to lift your load rather than burdening you with devotional obligations my child I'm seeking to take from you the tensions of life he's here today seeking to lift some of you are carrying heavy heavy loads heavy heavy loads precious sister Dunlop brother Dunlop oh so sick for oh so long he's seeking to lift your load he's seeking to lift your load I'm just going to sing a little song in closing. It was a melody that was there. I changed the words as I tend to do. Just close your eyes. I'm going to sing all three verses the Lord gave me, and then I'll turn it to Pastor to do as he feels. I hear you calling me. <clears throat> I'm sorry. This is us to the Lord. I hear you calling me in the morning time. With a voice so soft and sweet Arise, my love, come away with me 
my gifts for you are waiting at my feet and I hear you calling me in the noontime when cares of life press so heavy on me bury all of your past now cast your cares on me now strength and healing peace and love I can release and I hear you calling me in the evening time lay every burden here at my feet my beloved I'll give you healing restful sleep now rest in peace by faith my word I'll always keep an invitation to the throne room Well, I think we need to take him up on that invitation right now as you stand I'm going to invite you to make your way to this altar that becomes our way of entering into the throne room and coming before his throne it's so wonderful that we have the availability and the opportunity and the privilege and the amazing invitation it's also amazing how we let things distract us from taking him up on that invitation. Thank you, Sister Walker, for reminding us of what the distractions are, but how God wants to circumvent those distractions because he wants to be close to us. He wants us to be close to him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. God. Let's just close our eyes. Talk to Him. Just talk to Him. Thank you for inviting us into your throne. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Jesus is in this room. Here right now. Here right now. Thank you, Jesus. and 
an altar. There's a special gift for you in the foyer. And then Brother Aaron Brown has provided a cake in the back for all the mothers to enjoy a piece of that cake on this Mother's Day. I just wanted to remember to tell you that. Praise God. Praise God. Can we just close our eyes as they play that music and lift our hands to Him and thank Him once again for the incredible privilege of an open invitation. Think about that, an open invitation into His throne room of grace at all times. An open invitation. I know like me, you saw yourself in some of those examples Sister Walker saw in that vision the Lord gave her of what keeps us from the throne room. But God's there to help us and he is for us. I am so glad God is for us, not against us. He's wanting to help us. He's wanting to encourage us. He's wanting to draw us closer and closer and closer to him. So I want you to know that God is always trying to help us and draw us. And let's just respond. Let's just lift our hands and thank him right now. So we conclude this time. Let's thank him that he would love us in that way and invite us and care for us and draw us and woo us and, and teach us how we circumvent the distractions of the enemy that would keep us from receiving what we need to receive. And there is someone that has been carrying a heavy load. I don't know where that sack is. I think it's, I don't know where she, she took it. She went out. But I just felt in the Holy Ghost right now, someone's carried a heavy sack in here today. Would you just close your eyes and pray for the someones? It may be more than one someone, but I really felt that. It was like I saw it. You've carried, you've been carrying a heavy load. And and God brought you here this morning so that you could lay down that load. He is not here to say, oh, yes, carry that load. I just want you to be burdened down. It pleases me when you, you, you are nearly collapsing from the load, but you keep trying. Just, just keep carrying it. I love to watch you having to carry that heavy. That's not God. God said, cast all of your care upon me. Peter wrote it, casting all of our care upon him, for he careth for you. He's not wanting to, to force you to keep carrying a heavy load. He wants you to lay it down before his throne right now. Brother Herring's coming right now to close this out as we have to head for the airport right now. But thank you for your prayers. Praise God. Praise God. Let's look to the Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the word of God. We were so blessed to hear from the lips of your servant. Thank you, Jesus, that you have invited us, Lord, to your throne room, God, and you have made a way for us. You've given us a rite of passage. Thank you for those special passwords, Lord, that are from your word. And we're so appreciative, God, that you have called us and that you have sanctified us and filled us with your spirit, O oh Lord, and caused us, Jesus, to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I pray, O oh Lord, for everyone here today. Thank you, Jesus. Anyone who has any kind of a heavy burden that they're carrying, Lord, that they can throw it uh, on the altar of God and that they can cast all their care upon you and turn it over to you, Jesus. Praise God. And Lord, right now as we close on this day that we're remembering, commemorating, and honoring all of our mothers, so much in the Bible is said about mothers, so much, Lord, wonderful words, and so many wonderful mothers in Scripture that are used as examples to us. And Lord, we pray for every mother here today, everyone, Jesus, that, that has gone through the experience of bringing life into this world. And if they're heavy in heart, would you bless their heart? 
would you lift them, Jesus? Any mother, God, who is praying and interceding for a child that's away from God. Oh, Lord Jesus, as Sister Walker said, would you send that angel, send that angel to that child. Oh, God, you are able to do it, and we believe you. Thank you, Jesus. Bless all of the mothers today. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. One final time, let's worship the Lord. Jesus, thank you. We praise you and we bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Amen, amen. Greet one another. In Jesus' name, you are dismissed. Inside the throne room.